Gentlemen, start your engines. the racing roar has echoed off the buildings of Long Beach, California. First, the Formula 5000 ripped through a shabby downtown. The city grew and so did the race. In 77, Mario Andretti celebrated a Formula One win. Now, three IndyCar wins later here, Mario faces his last pass down Shoreline Drive. In 1986, son Michael kept the Andretti name alive with his first IndyCar win. Passing years reveal a beautiful skyline, and Al Hunter Jr. challenging the Andrettis. Al became the king of the beach for the next four years. Two years ago, Danny Sullivan brought his teammate Little Al's win streak to a screeching halt. Last year, Penske driver Paul Tracy scored his first IndyCar win. Today, Tracy has the pull. The run through the streets is about to begin. Round number three of the PPT IndyCar World Series, the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Hello and welcome. I'm Paul Page with the beautiful Queen Mary as a backdrop. We're ready to go racing. And here at Long Beach, the real trick is the fact that the entire track is rimmed with concrete walls. One mistake, and it'll snatch you right out of the lead of the race in no time flat. It's a very tactical race here as well. We have a great afternoon in store for you. Some surprises, too, on the grid. So let's take a look at the starting field. On the pole, it's Paul Tracy, the defending champion here at Long Beach. Alongside Al Hunter Jr., who won four in a row here from 88 to 91. In row two, Emerson Fittipaldi, the winner last week at Phoenix. Alongside is Nigel Mansell, the third place finisher last week at Phoenix. In row three, it's Robbie Gordon, who ran out of fuel while leading at Phoenix. In row number three, outside is Mario Andretti, a three-time IndyCar winner here. And row four, Raul Boisel to the inside. He has three top ten finishes here at Long Beach. And Mauricio Guzelmin, the highest qualifying Reynard chassis and the fastest rookie in this race. In row five, it's Michael Andretti, the 86 winner here. And Stefan Johansson, whose car is an unknown after crashing in qualifying. In row six, Bobby Rahal and Teo Bobby. In the seventh row, Marco Greco and Jacques Villeneuve. In row eight, Scott Goodyear, Ari Leyendijk. The ninth row, Dominic Dobson and Mark Smith. The tenth row, Adrian Fernandez and Alessandro Zampedri. In the eleventh row, it's Scott Sharp and Willie T. Ribs. The twelfth row, Jimmy Vassar and Mike Groff. Row thirteen, Davy Jones and Robbie Buell. In row fourteen, Frank Freon and Claude Bourbonnet. Row 15, Robbie Groff and Buddy Lazier. And those that came here but did not qualify, Mashushta, Kudre, and Johnny Unzer. The cars are on the track, and we're ready to go racing. This is Paul Page with Sam Posey and Bobby Unzer in the booth. Jack Arood and Gary Gerald are giving us coverage from trackside. This track here at Long Beach is a magnificent circuit, a temporary 1.59 miles around, eight turns, two very long and very fast straightaways. Here today, it is Paul Tracy that is the defending champion. He is also the holder of the race record. We expect pit stops for fuel as early as 18 laps, as late as 42. So now, they move around the circuit, ready to move into formation. One lap to go. They have already begun their pace lap. The two parade laps complete here at Long Beach. We ride with Scott Goodyear, looking forward from his car. All these cars will move into their familiar roles of two after they come off of the final hairpin turn. On board here, the Reynard of Michael Andretti. Scott Sharp is reported stalled on the race course. We'll keep track of that story, too. Now on Seaside, the backside, the second long straight, as you ride with the Robbie Gordon car. There's Scott as they're trying to get him started. The rest of the field is all set to go. And apparently what they'll do is get him started. And if he's lucky, he'll be able to start from the pits and follow the field. That should not be too much of a penalty. Looking off the front of Bobby Rahal's Honda-powered car. 
with our race analysis for today. Again, fuel stops as early as 18, as late as 42, depending on the yellows. Two stops if you want to do the race right. And look at that front of the field, three Penske cars and Nigel Mantle. They make the last pass that turns them now back toward the hairpin. And this right-hander into the hairpin. They should align here. This first corner is going to be very crowded. The rest of the field starts to come on. Now the crowd begins to roar. They give it the green. They give it the green. It surprises me, but they give it the green. The rest of the field struggling off of that hairpin turn as they battle down into the corner. Penske cars maintain their position, but they come three abreast. Everybody's through the first two corners safely. Well, that had to be one of the worst starts I think I've ever seen in any car racing. Flagman should have brought them around another time. They weren't lined up at all. Looks like only the Penske cars were aligned. It's now Tracy Allinger Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi. Nigel Mansell pursues from fourth place. In qualifying, the three Penske cars qualified within a tenth of a second of each other. It explains why they're running so close right now. Paul Tracy still running at the front of the field. Will he lead the first lap? Will he win another race here? He scored his first IndyCar victory at this track. Paul Tracy, the number three Penske car. Al Hunter Jr., the 31 car with a black rollover bar. And of course, there is Fittipaldi, the number two car, black number two. Penske scored his first win ever here last year as a team, having been shut out through all the Andretti and Unser years. Now he's come back with a vengeance with a car that is really handling beautifully here. Well, you know, Sam and Paul, there's one thing safe to assume, and that Penske has told his drivers, don't wreck into each other. Race, but save the really hard racing till right to the end of the race. This is the fight for fourth place as Robbie Gordon is closing on Nigel Mansell. The interesting, fourth. the interesting thing is to see Mansell, who had the pole here last year, of course, in Eclipse this year. Fourth fastest, only in qualifying, not a threat, at least at this point in the race. Mario Andretti closing on this battle as well. He is car number six, just behind Robbie Gordon. You know, Robbie Gordon has really set his sights on emulating Nigel Mansell. Uh, as Gordon matured in racing, it was Mansell who was achieving everything last year. So this means a lot for him to have Mansell in his sights right now. On board with Robbie Gordon now. Two laps are complete as they flash over the start-finish line. Here's through turn one and two. And down, swing far to the left, another right-hander. They don't do much shifting here. They come up from second gear to third to fourth. They hit fifth as they accelerate through these very fast sweepers out onto the back stretch. A very fast back straightaway right here, down into turn. They're on a good place to pass. We'll keep track of this car, Bobby Rahal. The corner workers are reporting that there's a fire in the left rear of his car. Now there's more than a fire, at least there's a lot of smoke. That's that yeah. Honda engine car, and it is in trouble now. Well, it's either going to be an engine or it's going to be some fiberglass. There's not fiberglass, it's carbon fiber. Most likely he's got engine problems. We can almost tell by how quick he pulls off. Let's look under there. Yeah, there is some fire very definitely under that car as Ray Hall heads into the pit. That's the body work that's burning up underneath there. This is a team which is having Jack some Roots trouble. right there as Bobby Rahal comes rolling down the pits now. And they will be ready with the fire equipment. It's probably not a serious situation, but certainly has everybody concerned. Jack? Well, Paul, Bobby Rahal brings his car in, and it is on fire in the left rear area. They're taking off the cowling for, towards the engine. But this is a tough day for Bobby Rahal because during the last practice session, he started this race realizing that he had a questionable gearbox. He did not go to the backup car, and it's an early DNF for Bobby Rahal and the new Honda engine here at Long Beach. Back on the circuit, you ride with number six, Michael Andretti there for a moment. There he is. Michael, after his extremely promising start in that new Renard chassis in uh, Surfers Paradise, Australia has had trouble at Phoenix a week ago and was not exceptionally fast in qualifying here either. That's Guggelme just ahead of him. Behind him is Johansson. On board with Michael again, and I just want to make a note on this car. It hasn't looked good. I've been down to the turns watching it all weekend. They have not got the car balanced. The shock absorbers look like they don't fit the racetrack well. Definitely are having trouble with the Renard cars here at Long Beach. Is there a solution to their problems, Bobby? Yes, it is, and it's probably just a discovery thing, Paul. It's just merely matching the track. We knew they were good in Australia, but they're just not working good here. He's practiced very well at Indianapolis, so that is promising as we look ahead. 
Michael Andretti has struggled with this car throughout the weekend as uh, Scott Sharp goes back into the race and is in the action. Gary Gerald, you have an update on the work they've been doing on this car? Well, indeed, Paul. You know, he won on the streets of Australia, but it's been a totally frustrating weekend here for this team. He says the problem has been getting grip to the rear of the car. I spoke with him just before he got in the cockpit before the start of this race, and he said it wasn't any better this morning. He qualified in the ninth spot, but he ran only 15 fast in the warm-ups. It's a very frustrated Michael Andretti, who won on the streets of Australia, not doing so well in the streets of Long Beach. Gary, Bobby and I watched Michael practicing the other day right from the edge of the track. He gets an awful lot of wheels, but he drives the wheels off the car as the crowd roaring approval when he comes by, but just no speed. Sammy said, Sammy said that that's one of the keys. He said you could hustle the car through the chicanes at Australia, but here, every time you try to put that power down, it just wants to get away from you, and you can't hustle the car. And he says it seems like the harder you try, the slower you get. Most of that is caused by different turns at Long Beach as opposed to Australia. Australia almost has straightaways at 90 degree turns. Here, as you can see, going around Long Beach, turns of different angles all over the place. The weather here in Southern California is overcast. Temperatures in the mid-70s, no threat of rain at all, but it looks like it's gonna be a super day for racing and just right air for carburation. The car right in front of Michael Guzman there, Mauricio Guzman, you see there the word Hollywood on the side of the car. That is Brazil's number one cigarette company, and it explains that uh, this is such an international series that that is a sponsor here. Now with Bobby Ray Hall out of the race, he's joined Jack Aroot. Well, Bobby, you were concerned about the gearbox. Is that what put you out? Well, it looks like an oil line broke. Um, it's too bad. The car, uh, we made a change in the morning session, and it really ran well, and I was looking forward to the race. And, it, you know, even with the oil leak in the first lap, which I was, you know, like it just, just this car was super in the, uh, in the corners. I was looking forward to it. It's just a damn shame. And he needed a boost here, Paul, because he was getting ready to go to Indianapolis for the 500. He didn't race in that race last year. Well, we hope Bobby Rahal doesn't have a repeat of last year as uh, he did uh, not make it into the Indy 500-mile race. Watching Raul Boisel now, he runs in sixth place. So at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, it's Paul Tracy in front, being chased by Al Hunter Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi. Watching now as we keep an eye on Raul Boisel, I'm Paul Page with Sam Posey, Bobby Unser, Jack Arut, and Gary Gerald. We are at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. We are on the eighth lap of the race. Paul Tracy, who was the pole sitter with a new track record, jumped to the lead, followed by his Penske teammates, Al Unser Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi. Nigel Mansell sits in fourth, Robbie Gordon in fifth. They have not changed in the top positions on this track as you look not only at the positions, but also their time behind the leader of the race. We keep track of the eighth place car now, the 88 machine of Mauricio Guzman, who is a rookie on this track and the highest qualifying Renard. But he's a Grand Prix veteran of 74 Grand Prix races. We see Al Unser Jr. in car number 31. Al has a birthday coming up in just a couple of days. He is 31 now, same as his car number. He'll soon be 32. Now he's getting to be an old man already, isn't he, Sam? Now speak for yourself, Bob. <laughs> Ellinger Jr., second place. Man who has infused, it seems, a new spirit into this team. Well, Matter of fact, they say that Fittipaldi really likes his presence. Well, in a sense, Al gave his 20s to the Rick Gallus team, and I think he'll give his the decade of his 30s to the Penske team. And he is a man who can bring attitude to a team, and that's very important. They say, how much does a driver really mean in a team? Is he just the guy that stands on the accelerator? No, he inspires the whole team. That's right. I was just down talking to Jerry Breon, the right rear man and very important man on that team, does all the fabrication work on that car. And he said the same thing. He said they are so happy with little Al because he brought a lot of motivation and enthusiasm to that team. And that's what a team is all about. Teams are really teams, not individuals. No change at the top of the order. Paul Tracy runs alone. You're looking at the key battle on the race court. It's a fight for second between Fittipaldi and Little Al. Although, speaking of teams, the Penske team runs one car against another against another. In other words, they have an intramural rivalry there. Each team run in the pits by a different tactician. So this is a real race for points that we're watching, not just a demonstration by the Penske team. Paul Tracy runs alone as we keep an eye on the fight within the Penske team. 
Gracie is one of only eight drivers ever to lead here at Long Beach. We're back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach as we take a look at the running order. The field led from the green by Paul Tracy. The battle is between Unser Jr. and Fittipaldi. Though for the moment it is broken off just a bit as they've had to cycle around the car of Claude Bourbonnet, who when they first came up on him really pitched it sideways, almost caught the wall, but kept it going. New driver to the Indy cars, Bourbonnet. Exactly. Paul Tracy, a fellow Canadian, is uh, driving a car that is brand new here. You will recall if you saw the race at Phoenix last week that he wrecked that car. Penske uh, Racing has a bunch of new cars. This is one of them. They had problems with the brake and gear linkage on Friday. Lost some practice time, and they came back really strong. Fittipaldi runs in third place, chasing Al Unser Jr. Jack Arrude, do you have an update? Well, Paul Samposi alluded to the fact that there are three distinct sets of tactics in Team Penske. We may begin to see some of them unfolding for Emerson Fittipaldi. Their team is electing to look for a yellow as early as lap 15. They want to come in early and try and use attrition to work their way back to the front. They're hoping that there will be a full course yellow. History has shown that there generally is between laps 15 and 25. I was going to say, Jack, and by the way, we have a uh, car off and in a very precarious area. They may get it, Dominic Thompson, so they may actually get their wish. And we'll see if he's going to get restarted. But Jack Arut, if I can ask you further, did it, was not that the anticipation of everybody up and down the pits that there would be a year early yellow, in fact, perhaps earlier than this? Well, most people felt because of the tight quarters of racing here, Paul, that there would be several full, full course yellows. But in the case of Roger Penske's crew, as you know, although we've alluded to the fact that sometimes he calls the shots, they are left to make their own decisions. And this was a decision they made after warm ups this morning. So now back to the front of the field, Paul Tracy, the number three car, still leads it, and it doesn't seem that they're going to go to full course yellow while Dominic Dobson sits in what appears to be a fairly precarious position. Well, normally they're not. They'll just have an area, what we call an area yellow right there for Dominic, but on the Penske cars, Paul, the cars ironically are identical cars. The settings on them are almost to the degree exactly the same as one of the other, but the game plans for the race are up to the team's individual. They can do pit stop or game planning any way they want to as far as Pinsky's concerned. Take a look as they get down toward the first corner at the back of Paul Tracy's car here, the fin, the shark fin. They first came out with that a week ago at Phoenix, and it's part of development that leads to an announcement this week that they made that they're going to be racing at Indianapolis with the Mercedes engine, a push rod production based engine. Paul, this is really an earth shattering announcement uh, made jointly by Penske Racing and Mercedes Benz. They're not going to race with the Mercedes next year at Indy. They're going to race this year. It's probably the best kept secret in racing in the last 10 or 15 years, I would say. What it means, they're going to take advantage of what you might call a loophole or an incentive clause in the Indy rules, run a stock block engine, which rumors already have posted, they think, as much as 1,000 horsepower. They should have tremendous, at least a speed advantage. Reliability will, will, of course, be a question, but it's major racing news. Penske and Mercedes getting together. And ironically, Sam, the reliability on the engine and the testing, they've run many tests so far at 500 miles and longer, five to 600 miles with the same engine without any failure. And believe it or not, they were running in all that snow back in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, shoveling snow all night long, starting to run at 8 o'clock in the morning. Don't you, find, secrecy. don't you find it amazing that they kept that a secret? And they kept the fin a secret. I mean, the Penske group is really operating as marked men now. You wonder what else they might know about what's ahead. Competition's very severe today. Something else to remember as we look forward to the Indy 500. Push rod engine has completed 200 laps, the full 500 miles, only once in the last 25 years. So and we keep track of the leader, Paul Tracy. You can see he's pulled out ahead of second place, Al Unser Jr., but Emerson Phil Fittipaldi is staying in the fight. at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, and there is a problem, as you can see. Down in the first corner, two cars together, one Paul Tracy with Mike Groff. Here's what happened. Chasing into the corner as Tracy was working through traffic. 
Got caught up behind the 19 car, Bobby. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Paul was committed to go to the inside, as you can see right there. The 19 car, Robbie Bill, is braking too fast. Paul had more rear, rear brakes than the front brakes. He locked it up, spun it. He just was pressing too hard into the corner, in my opinion. And he was lucky that Groff was alert and able to get on the brakes right there. Damage to the front of Groff's car, I don't see a lot on Tracy's car. No, but he's obviously killed his engine. Leaves him in a terrible position. In effect, he's about the same as being out of the race, no matter what happens. This, of course, catapults Al Unser Jr. into the lead. A man who won this race four times in a row and had a fifth all lined up when he was tapped from behind by Danny Sullivan. Now, one of the things that'll happen, Sam, Paul is Inski is going to tell little Al what Tracy did. Obviously, it was his fault. He just overdrove going into the turn a little bit. And little Al's going to be a little bit more careful himself, especially if Emma doesn't come up and start pushing him too hard. Well, little Al, of course, has been involved a couple of times in incidents here, too. And it just shows that at Long Beach, the racing is extremely close and things can go wrong, as Paul said at the top of the show, in a split second. IndyCar safety team out there trying to get Paul Tracy going again as well as Groff. Allinger Jr. assumes the lead on the 22nd lap of the race. Still no full course yellows, so no reason yet for the teams to pull their cars down into the pits. We started this race with eight rookies to Long Beach, so that kind of thing is very likely here. Drivers unfamiliar with the circuit at full race track. And as people look ahead to the Indianapolis 500, that high number of rookies is a cause for great concern. Here where incidents happen, like the ones we've seen so far, they happen at very low speeds. With these strong cars, everybody gets out of them safely most of the time. At Indy, things may be very different. But Sam, even though the speeds here at Long Beach look kind of slow to people, 108 mile an hour average lap, they're actually running 190 miles an hour down the straightaway here at Long Beach. So people have to have the right perspective to speed. It's the slow turns, it's the hairpin that brings the average down so low here. Well, I wouldn't want to be a nose ornament on one of these cars, I'll tell you. Well, that's for sure, especially Paul Tracy a little while ago. <laughs> Jr. definitely caught up in traffic now and taking care, I think, as he's coming through there. He's being cautious. This is the first time that Al Jr. has really led a race substantially for Roger Penske since he joined the team this season. So this is a very proud moment. And an important moment for him. Yeah, psychologically, you always wait to make that mark with the new team, particularly when it's a team with the rich history of Penske and, of course, this deal long in the coming and now reaching fruition. You know, just like that hairpin turn right there where you saw a little Al working up on that lap traffic, Sam. He doesn't want to go in there and touch a wing. That would just be disastrous at this point. Watch him right here going down the end of the front straightaway here, very fast speed. Very careful not to take any chances on passing right now. 16 cars still on the leader lap. Al Unser Jr. is trying to pass Adrian Fernandez in the seven car just ahead of him. Fernandez currently runs in 16th place. So at the top of the order now with the change is Al Unser Jr., then Fittipaldi, then Nigel Mansell now third. Robbie Gordon is fourth. Mario Andretti runs in fifth place, followed by Raul Boisel, Mauricio Guzman, Michael Andretti, Stefan Johansson, Marco Greco has moved up into the top ten and runs tenth right now. Al Unser Jr. is leading his race for the seventh time in 11 years. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach the leaders now very carefully having to tiptoe their way through traffic Emerson Fittipaldi trying to find a way perhaps in between Adrian Fernandez and Ari Leyendijk the two cars that just just ahead he's around Leyendijk now trying to stay in contact with his teammate Al Unser Jr. who is the leader. Little Al had problem getting around this thing. Whoa, and Davy Jones is in trouble along with Mark Smith. Jones is going to try to get it going again, but remember, those walls are right there. You know, the big secret to spinning out here, which does happen occasionally, is not to kill your engine. Davey didn't kill his, but it looks like now that he has. In other words, kept his engine running. Here's a replay of it coming down. All right, the two cars were battling for ninth, 19th place. Jones just got into the side of Mark Smith as they came in the corner. Davey. Nigel ducked by on the inside. Nigel was the lucky one. Davey locked up his brakes. When you lock up your brakes and you can't let them off real quick, you have, in effect, no steering. He ran right into the side of Mark Smith. The problem, 
was it would have been Davy Jones. He's the guy that caused that one. He has been having a very unhappy year in that A.J. Foyt car crash at Surfers Paradise trouble last week. He just, I talked to him uh, about an hour before the race. His morale is low, and this isn't going to help any. Sometimes teams just don't click, and these two guys are not clicking. Uh, I've been down the turn stand watching Davy. Sometimes he looks good. Sometimes he looks terrible. So he's not working with the mechanics properly. Somewhere or another, the whole team is just not working together. And Mark Smith, of course, a very promising young driver from the Northwest, is he's had his problems too. Didn't even qualify for last week. He rode it out in the hospital. Now it would appear that Davy Jones, he got out there, had first gear, but no reverse. Now remember, these cars on a road circuit are supposed to have reverses. Maybe his is not working, but he was able to take off without getting a push start there. He has a reverse gear. He told me he did. Nigel Mansell, of course, has moved into third now as we ride with him. Here's what happened. Boy, look at Nigel. He almost totally lost it. Lock to lock. Whoa! That was close. But look at the reflexes by Nigel Mansell. I mean, he really owes uh, the fact that he's still in the race to the fact that he saw what was coming and had those incredible reflexes along with good judgment. All right, Jack Arute, pit side. Update on Paul Tracy. Well, you guys were talking about the fact that there's a problem if you don't keep the car going. Well, that was the case with Paul Tracy. He had to get the car restarted, lost the valuable time. The only thing that he had wrong with the car when they came in is he had actually tore up the tire on the right rear. They replaced that tire, and now he's back, but he's way off the lead pace. Jack, unfortunately, I don't know what his, mor his morale was, but Tracy has yet to outgrow the, uh, the sense that he's a mistake maker, and he made another one today, a small one, but so costly. Sammy's down, Tracy down six laps. That's more than you can overcome, even with the good Lord helping you there. Watching the battle for ninth place, ninth is the 25 car of Marco Greco. He has uh, right behind him Teo Fabi, and Scott Goodyear is there well. Jack Aroot? Well, there's several great stories, though, Paul, about Paul Tracy. You remember, it was only three years ago that he tried to run a Dale Coyne car here. His father and he saved up their money from their construction business, and they came here, and they only made a couple of laps. He left dejectedly and thought he was going to have to go into the construction business. That's when Roger Penske sent word that he should come over and meet with him. They signed later that year a testing contract. And then Paul Tracy, one year later, comes back and wins here at Long Beach. So he's had more than his share of ups and downs here on Oceanside Drive. Well, for a moment, Marco Greco was able to pull away from Teo, and Teo is locked in this tremendous battle with Scott Goodyear and Zach Villeneuve just behind him, a three-way battle for 10th place. Occasionally, they catch up tonight. Well, we've got to watch that a little bit. Now, those guys are weaving back and forth, almost having a lot of contact. Nobody is driving any harder than those three for a while there, Paul. Well, Marco Greco is driving, you might say, a little bit over his head in terms of the record that he has. His best finish ever in IndyCar competition is 11. So he's really, and you can see a couple of times, Fabi in the yellow car there trying to get by him, Greco cutting him off. I think Greco's doing a beautiful job, but whether he can sustain it or not is the question. I saw Marco in the paddock area last night, end of the day. Most everyone else was gone. And Marco was just so pleased with his qualifying effort. He says he finally really has a car and a team that he thinks can do something. And he seems to be proving it here. So at the front of the field, it's Al Unser Jr. Little Al started second and took the win. The winner started second the last three years here at Long Beach. He leads it now. We're back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. These aerial shots are courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Eagle based in Carson, California, just up the freeway. Today's pilot is Joel Chamberlain from Norwood, Massachusetts. There she is overhead. Cameras on board. There's some pretty good coverage. Well, Al Anser Jr. had to fight his way through that battle that we were covering for 10th place. He's now completed his 35th lap of 105, but it was touch and go for a moment. Those guys fighting for 10th were pretty serious. Oh, man, Paul, they were really serious. You know, it's hard on a guy that's lapping cars like that because you get right in the middle of a fight. It's like jumping in the middle of a dog fight. Look here. Whoa! Jimmy Vassar, and it looks like the Smith car as well. Mark Smith in trouble again. Jimmy Vassar over there on the right. Mark Smith has been the victim of a lot of problems today. Vassar has two. They had mechanical problems. Oh, Candace. my goodness. I had no idea he got that time. Right over the wheels. That's what happens in open wheel racing when one car locks wheels with another. I was at Jets at dinner last night explaining this to people. 
how running over wheels is the most dangerous thing that can happen in IndyCar racing. And that's exactly what happens from it. They get airborne. Well, Mark Smith was in a pre-race accident at Phoenix a week ago, suffered a head injury. They kept him overnight in the hospital and then released him. So he's back racing this week, and now he's involved in this. How sad. At least he came down right side up, and that's the main thing. Uh, Open wheel cars are not going to get upside down. It didn't appear that there was a concern for Mark. He's out of the car and okay. This car, of course, owned by Derek Walker Racing, who also, also owns Robbie Gordon's car and Willie T. Ribs, and they've had any number of accidents so far this year. I think this might make the seventh or eighth, which is very bad luck. Still looking at that battle as here comes Villeneuve moving up to the inside of Goodyear. Goodyear sees him there, lets him through, but that was close. Oh, that was an impossible. <laughs> I think Villeneuve just has to be a, a young man, and nobody told him that he couldn't do that, so he went ahead and did it anyway. Villeneuve, of course, the great French Canadian, is 23. He's the youngest driver in the race here, and he is ambitious. He Probably got a little over his head at Phoenix uh, last week when he triggered that multi-car pileup. Didn't observe the yellow flags perhaps the way he should. You see, he is an ambitious driver. Uh, Barry Green, the crew chief there, says he is one of the most intelligent chassis uh, drivers that he's ever worked with. Brings back the good information. But Sam, you won't make a pass like he just made very many times without a collision. Without getting, uh, with getting away with it, I know. Is that the patented Bobby Unzer move there? We've I seen know. you do that. I was sitting here crossing my fingers when I saw that thing happening, when I saw him go to the outside. Yeah, we I never thought, had to do that for you, Bobby. No, no. I <laughs> And look at him as he loses the back end again. But that's been one of the reported problems with uh, with his, both the Lola and the Renard. Is they lose the back end. Now he's wandering all over the place. You wonder if he doesn't have a bad tire. That is a Renard car he's driving, by the way. The blue car we're talking about in the center here at this back. I think it, there's nothing wrong with that car. It's just the fact that kid is trying hard. 23 years old, he really doesn't know any better yet. Around Marco Greg oh. opened and into the wall. Into that tire barrier, loses it, but he keeps it going. That's Whoa! What I mean. That's what I mean. I'm telling you, yeah, that's what's nice to be 23 years of age. He doesn't even know these race cars can bite you yet. <laughs> Damage to the rear wing. He's gonna. That's a shortcut into the pits that you are allowed to take if you have a problem in the car. It looks like if he can get rid of that banner, maybe pop rid of that wing back in place, he's gonna go again. Quick thinking to duck into the pits that way. Yeah, remember now, the rear wing is broken. You look at the piece hanging down from it. We really did That's see. That's not a livable situation on the racetrack going fast. That's something they'll have to fix. He was over his head there. It was exciting to watch, but he was over his head. That's not a car problem, Sam. He's just like you said. Already the, uh, the team has the spare wing out, and they're ready to go. And we're going to keep an eye here because best indications are that Alan Zer Jr. may head for the pits any time now. Yep. And here he is. So Alan Sir Jr. comes in for his stop, Jack. And Paul, there was some debate as to whether they would make a wing adjustment on the front of the car. Richard Buck goes to work, and they do. They adjust the wing. They're going to change all four tires. A nominal stop this way. You can see a lot of the dust that comes off the, the actual brake rotors from the use of the brakes here at the Long Beach. Remember, they shift 1,690 times. Little Al having trouble shifting that time to get back out in a little over 18.4 seconds. Now, another thing to remember as you watch Little Al leave the speed limit in the pits today, 60 miles an hour. What they call the drop dead means they get a black flag, 66. If the radar gun says 66, until they get right there, they have to pull them in on a black flag. Over the blue line there, only two tires. Jack told us this from the driver's meeting today. And ironically, it's hard to keep these cars down to 60 in the pit lane, particularly when you launch them, because by the time the wheels have stopped, stopped spinning in that low gear, you're up over 60. Emerson Fittipaldi picked up the lead of the race, but he comes in for his stop now on the 41st lap, Jack. And Paul, watch for some tactics unfolding. They connect the hose. The word we got is they may very well just put enough fuel in the amount of fuel that it takes to change all four tires. We're going to wait and see if that's what they do. That's exactly what they do. A tactical move, Gary Gerald. Nigel Mansell's crew servicing him for the first time off the jacks. This is a good stop. Now a delay on the fuel. He's rolling in 13.8 seconds. Great stop for the Newman Haas team. Fascinating stop for Penske. It takes longer to fuel than it does to change tires. 
and they decided to just drop it as soon as the as soon as the tires were changed, eh, Jack? Well, here's what they're going to try and do. They were debating whether they should make that type of stop now or for their final stop. It's what we call a time stop. They've calculated their fuel and they feel that in one of the stops they were going to take on a full load. They felt that with the way Al Unser Jr. is running, that now's the time to lay the cards on the table and see what their compatriot Roger Penske will do to match that in the last stop. Now the last stop will be the long stop because they got to take on a full load of fuel. Bobby, normally it's a switch of that. You time stop the last stop. It's the first time I've ever Absolutely. seen it Absolutely. And now we're getting word that number 31, Al Unser Jr., may be getting a stop and go penalty. Yeah, it looked to me like in the first seconds after he started away from his pits, he might have exceeded that 60. Let me tell you, it's very difficult. All the drivers say that in second gear, trying to go between 60 and 70 miles an hour is critical. He was clocked reportedly at 80 miles an hour. In fact, Ellinger Jr. was one of the drivers in the driver's meeting that lobbied quite oh, really hard to try and have the, the actual speed limit raised from 60 to 70, but he lost in a blind vote of all the drivers in the field. So many things happening at once here. We saw another car stuck into the tire barrier. We'll try to get you up to speed on everything. Well, that was Marco Greco, who was having such a great race up until then. So we'll keep track of that. And let's take a look. There comes the two car through. Now, little Al still came out in the lead on this all this pit stop strategy, Paul. But remember, what you gain one time, you're going to pay for it later on. So I'm not too sure a strategy like that is good. Yeah, here we come. Here's little Al coming in for it. Obviously, the stop and go penalty. And people have to realize they're hey, run a car that's capable of 230, 240 miles an hour down to 60 miles an hour is sometimes just utterly ridiculous. So a lot of the drivers could be having that problem today. This, of course, puts Emerson Fittipaldi into the lead the first time he has ever led a race here at Long Beach. Interesting. Bobby, there has been some concern, a uh, couple of people that we've talked to this weekend, most notably A.J. Foyt, that they're so fast on that black flag for exceeding the speed limit in the pits, and yet no penalty last week for Nigel Mansell at Phoenix when he jumped over the grass strip and got out on the race course, and no penalty for Bill Neff after, uh, after coming around and hitting Mashusta in that accident at Phoenix. Well, what it is, a lot of the racing people, they are screaming politics, inadequate officiating by Wally Dahlenbeck, the chief steward, who on race day is totally in charge. And I think that there's something to some of this stuff. Uh, certain guys get penalized, and they seem to get penalized often. Other guys don't get penalties at all. For example, Nigel Mansell oh, right oh, there on the right number one. Inside of uh, Michael Andretti, very almost, exciting. Almost collided with Michael there. But Nigel Bob, has Father really and been, son are having an argument here. Yeah, Nigel has been kind of immune to penalties, and, and uh, I think everybody's getting a little bit tired of that. Let's go pit side, Gary Gerald. Just a quick update on Bill Neuve. He came in, and while that whole flurry of pit stops was taking place up and down the road, the Forsyth Green team replaced the entire rear wing. He's now back on course. They had some damage up around the wicker bill, so they replaced the whole rear wing assembly. Lost a lot of time, but he's still in the competition. Also, we've had reports of a couple of more of those pit lane violations. Davy Jones, 68 miles an hour. They were going to penalize Greco. As you mentioned, he ended up in a tire barrier. Bill Neff lost five laps and dropped the 20th position with that long stop while they repaired the wing. Still pretty quick service there. Let's give you the top of the order. Emerson Fittipaldi leads it, followed by Allinger Jr., 15 seconds behind. Then Nigel Mansell, Robbie Gordon, Raul Boisel. We're watching Mario. They came through a yellow flag that flies uh, for Marco Greco at the end of the main straightaway. Mario and Michael are running together on this course, and as we've seen, have been at one another fairly constantly in the last few laps. So it's still Fittipaldi, or now Fittipaldi in reality, that leads at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. This is Paul Page. We're back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach where the yellow flags fly in tandem, two of them at the start-finish line, indicating a full force yellow. So they will now line up behind Johnny Rutherford in the pace car and any advantage which was 12 seconds that Emerson Fittipaldi had gained over Al Unser Jr. is now lost. While we don't have an official reason one suspects that cars which are in barriers all around the course are the reason 
They want to get all the safety equipment out, get everything pulled out of the barriers, and the course clear again, wouldn't you say, Bobby? Oh, it certainly is right, Paul. There comes a point in time where they just have to say there's too many cars in too many places, and they could have wrecks start to stack up on top of the wreck. So they have to stop and clean it all up. Marco Greco's car in the barrier there, and out comes the uh, out comes the wrecker to get that one. Last week at Phoenix, race fans saw one of the most frightening crashes in recent history. Gary Gerald had an opportunity to look more closely at that incident. Without question, the incident that we saw last week in Turn 4 at Phoenix has to be one of the most frightening incidents that we've seen in recent years in IndyCar racing. Let's go back and reconstruct this scenario. Coming out of turn three, incidental contact between Aaron Bautista and Teo Fabi. As they spun up toward the wall, Paul Tracy's car was collected as well. Hero was left setting broadside to the traffic. And several seconds later, Jacques Villeneuve came rushing toward turn four, jumped on the brakes, but hit Hero literally broadside. Amazingly, all the drivers were able to walk away relatively uninjured. Let's take a look at what remains now of Hero's car. You can see that here the cockpit where the driver sets facing in this direction, but the monocoque with all the carbon fiber all intact. It was cracked down inside, but it did stand up under the punishment. Here's where the impact came across, right behind the roll bar. And you can see it tore through the carbon fiber. It separated the whole rear half of the car. There are four large mounting bolts back here where the engine is located. All of that just literally ripped away. But perhaps the most astounding aspect of this crash is right here, around this fuel cell. There were 35 gallons of methanol here. And for the first time in recent years, we saw a fuel cell rupture. And it's an absolute miracle that that fuel didn't ignite and we would have had fire on top of that horrifying crash. Now, from Villeneuve's standpoint, you can see the remains of the damaged chassis or tub. This is the nose section that was so graphically chewed and torn up by that horrendous impact. All of the carbon fiber literally shredded. And thanks to a rules change made in IndyCar just over a year or so ago, the driver's footbox area was lengthened, the driver moved back, an extra bulkhead was placed in here. And because of those changes, Villeneuve was able to walk away without any injury to his feet. It's also interesting to take a look at some downloaded information from the onboard computer. This charts the speed on the lap just ahead of the impact. Speed building on the back straightaway to 190 miles per hour. Then as he came upon the problem, he's under braking here, slowing down dramatically to a point when suddenly we saw the brake smoke. This is where he locked up the brakes. The impact came a fraction of a second thereafter at just over 100 miles per hour. Obviously, for young Villeneuve, it had to be a terrifying moment when he realized that he was about to hit a helpless fellow driver. Well, you always learn uh, from your mistake. Uh, you know, all, all, I know that the subject of the yellow light had been brought up in the driver's briefing because they're very tough. They were very tough to see, and uh, well, you know, it just happened on us. It could happen on anybody, and at those speeds, you know, it's just a flicker of a second, and. And if, if you miss a yellow light, something big can happen. And, uh, well, I'm going to be looking for them. Gary, surprisingly, in the driver's meeting, very little was said about that particular incident at Phoenix International Raceway. As you alluded to, a lot more discussion, though, about the incident that involved Nigel Mansell, where after a pit stop, he accelerated through the warm-up lane and literally spun into the racing groove, exiting in the wrong area, directly in front of Scott Goodyear. Now, there was a lot of heated discussion about that, why there wasn't a penalty. And Wally Dallenbach, to his credit, said there is nothing in writing There was no, as far as what the penalty should be or, as we have at Michigan International Speedway, a situation that was addressed last year. He threw it open to the drivers, and he explained to them, gentlemen, from this day forward, if you want to discuss a rule, paint a line, show that it's, it's no different than when Mario Andretti spun 180 degrees on pit road last year at MIS, we'll address it then, but we can't do it retroactively. Interestingly enough, Interestingly enough, also, Nigel Mansell stood up and said, hey, I messed up. If you want to take, give me a one-lap penalty and take away my points, I'll take that penalty as well. A lot of interesting things in the driver's meeting. A lot of conversations going on there. By the way, Hiro Mashuta, he did not qualify for this race. That's not to say that he was not here and tried. 
They were using a year old car. He was very definitely here and doing his best to qualify. So he suffered no injury despite that spectacular. Crash. Well, he did suffer some strains and, and bangs up because in between the times that he was driving the car, he had a trainer with him pulling on his arms and trying to get him in shape. Coming up next month on ABC, it's back to the Brickyard. First on Saturday, May 14th, Auto Racing's best try to beat the clock and grab the pole as we begin coverage of the Indianapolis 500 time trials. And then two weeks later on May 29th, it's the sport's most spectacular event, the Indianapolis 500 Live, all next month here on ABC Sports. The field lines up. Looking for a green flag as they come off of Seaside and through the final three corners heading to the main straightaway. Been under full course yellow the past several laps now, five in fact. We've completed the 51st lap of the race. Well, a lot but of people thought, could we? Uh, George, George Harrison, Harrison and Tom Petty, course, both race fans. Harrison, a good friend of Emerson Fittipaldi's, must like very much what he sees. Green flag comes out again. Emerson Fittipaldi leads the field down. Immediately, Allinger Jr. comes in pursuit. Nigel Mansell third, Robbie Gordon fourth. Michael and Mario, they battle and battle for position. The position is sixth. And as we look at when they cross the start-finish line on the restart here, Paul, four seconds behind for little Al compared to Ammo. Mario has been ahead of Michael throughout uh, the race, so the fact that Michael did not get by there just then does not mean that he's going to be held off. What is important is that Michael is now ahead of Guzman there. Both those cars were in and run out of the same team, the Chip Ganassi team, but with different engineers. So you ride with Michael Andretti, the Reynard car, chasing the Lola of his father just ahead. They'll have breakfast in the morning together, and that pretty well ends the conversations for the day. It's amazing sometimes, like with Michael and his father, Mario, who's right in front of him there, how close they run together and how often we worry about them touching each other. But ironically, they work like a team that way. In other words, they very seldom have a problem together. Well, of course, when they both ran for Newman Haas, they were able to share technical information, which I think both of them enjoyed tremendously. Now mums the word, of course, technically. Black flag given to Scott Goodyear for exceeding the speed limit into the pits. He came in and out for a stop and go you penalty. Know what? That, he, hap that happened last year. He was so running in right, 20th. Yeah, he was running second at the middle of the race last year when he was black flag for speed into the pits. Let's go to the pits, Gary Gerald. Gary? I thought Gary had something for us. You know, yes, I just wanted to mention that it, it seems sometimes like black flags and penalties are determining the race too much or making the race. When we have racing, that's far better than we've had for many years. I hate to see Black Black be the whole deciding point. Let's try Gary Gerald again. Well, Paul, it's been a really tough day for Scott Goodyear and the Budweiser team. Just before that penalty, he had gotten restarted. He had to spend time in the pits because the heim joint on the shifting mechanism had broken. And so they had to replace that, got him back out in his anxiety. He broke the law, had to come in on that stop and go. Keeping well, a nine out of the 31 car of Alenzer Jr. That's Stefan Johansson just behind him, but he has one lap off of the race. Currently running in ninth place. You just saw the full running order. Stefan Johansson normally very fast on road circuits, been very fast in practice, but he had an accident yesterday. I don't think they have their car quite up to speed since then, Paul. In fact, that car was fairly heavily damaged. The uh, team was working quite late last night. I was surprised with the damage he sustained in practice yesterday that they were going to get that car back together at all. They did a beautiful job. Well, we were both talking and wondering how they were going to find a car for it because we didn't think the car could be repaired overnight. So it shows you sometime how good the mechanics really are. Bettenhausen team was borrowing parts from everywhere to get that thing going. Alan for Jr. picks his way through traffic. Uh, the car in question is the blue and uh, red car that's just off the screen to the right. You'll see it come through in a second. Johansson right there. Former Grand Prix driver, uh, several times on the podium in Grand Prix, finishing in the first three, but never managed to win. And he's never managed to win here either. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi has now completed 55 laps, 14 laps since his last stop as the leader of the race. Six and a half seconds back is Allenzer Jr. Two seconds behind little Al is Nigel Mansell, first, second, and third. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. We're back 
Connecticut, round number three, the PPG and Car World Series, the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Emerson Fittipaldi is the leader of the race. 59 laps of the 105 lap scheduled distance are complete. The early leader was Paul Tracy, but then coming through traffic, lapping cars, he got into trouble and off the course. That took him out of the lead. Then Al Enzer Jr. picked up the lead of the race. And little Al and the Penske team did a fascinating maneuver. They pulled a time stop for their first pit stop, hoping to try to pick up some time and set themselves up for the end of the race. Al Enzer Jr. runs in second place. Place now Nigel Mansell third Robbie Gordon fourth Raul Boisel fifth and they've really been having some hard battles the last had a lot of cars to pass because he did get that penalty back in the field he's been complaining over the radio that he'd like to see more move over flags and I don't blame him for wanting that but the other guys would like that too Paul any help you can take we're watching Mauricio Guzman and Stefan Johansson as they were battling for a little bit there. Now the leader's coming around to overhaul Guzelman, who's having a pretty good day. And oh, as he gets it sideways. Now that's more than one time there for Tracy right in this race. Paul is really having a problem, and I'd have to think that the problem he's actually having is he has too much rear brake. As soon as he touches the brakes hard, he I locks the rear tires, and around it goes. I was going to say it happened. Same place. Same, Same problem. That's got to be a brake. Yeah, these, these cars have adjustments inside of them. They can adjust the brakes. You can watch him now. He's come underneath Gojiman there. Starts pushing on the brakes. Watch the fronts don't lock enough. You see the rears light up. Now, that's his Paul's fault. He's probably adjusted the brake bias the wrong way, causing the problem from the cockpit. And the point is, Bobby, if your fronts lock up, the car remains fairly stable. When the rears lock up, you swap in. Well, of course, the idea, Sam, is to have all four of them if they're going to lock, lock at the same time, which is almost impossible. Yeah. You got a good idea, too, there from that one shot on the replay of all the brake that is being done going in that corner, all those black marks. What do they do in the cockpit, Bobby, to keep him from twisting the brake control the wrong direction? Well, it's called education. Just tell the guy to the right does one thing, to the left does the other. And what happens is the drivers are smart enough to know that. The problem is they get excited in the race. They forget which way they needed to turn the bias. They turn it the wrong way. Then he finds out when he's at the end of 190 mile an hour straight away. Well, Tracy trying to come back up to speed now. He is uh, well out of the uh, top 20. But just and virtually six a laps, bad. now seven laps behind the lead. It's just a virtually a bad day for Paul. Looks like it just gets worse as it goes on. I bet he's really wondering by now. Smooth run for Emerson Fittipaldi now. He runs in the lead of the race. Jack Aroot, you have an update. Emerson slows. All of a sudden, Emerson slows. Jack Aroot's been watching from pit side. Emerson raises his hand, indicating that he is slowing. And this looks like a serious problem. Here is little Al taking the lead. Al comes past, picks up the lead of the race. Let's go pit side. Jack Aroot, do you have any idea what's going on? Well, Paul, we're getting conflicting reports. You know, one of the things that happened with Team Penske this year is they have scrambled their radio, so you can't eavesdrop. The team is a little concerned. At first, they thought it might be a gearbox problem, but now the secondary thought is it may be an electrical problem. He's limping away his way back to the pits where the, the crew will take a look at it, and we'll give you a report then. And the hairpin now, he'll be around that corner in a second. Another thing to remember now, Penske cars are all identical. So Roger Penske is going to be worrying. Whatever happened to Ambo, is it going to happen to Little Al, too? Because it's obviously going to be his only chance of winning this race with Little Al. So he'll be the first one to want to know what is wrong with Emma's car when it comes in right now. All right, Emerson heads for the pits. Jack is waiting. Well, Bobby Unser, you were alluding to the fact that they felt the engine sounds fine here. They're going to change tires. It may have been that he had a problem finding a gear because it looks as if they're not going to take any cowlings off. And one of the things that we were told, because of the type of gear ratios you have to run here, sometimes you can clip off a little piece of the gear. He stalled the engine now. Now, when you're shifting, and Emmo is not at all happy, but Bobby, as you know, with the different gears between first, second, third, and fourth, you can clip them off, and it can become difficult shifting. Jack, the most likely problem is, is that Emmo ran out of fuel. Remember, he had a time to stop. Most likely, he's out of fuel, and the reason it dies right now is it hasn't purged the air out of the system. It's fuel injection, but it but still Bobby, has to get the air out. But Bobby, he came in, took his normal stop. He stalled after the stop. He had taken on the fuel. It still and it sounds gotten... like he's still stuck in that fifth gear. Major development as far as the championship standings are concerned. Emerson came in here with a substantial lead, 37 points to 22 for his nearest.
Harris pursuer, and if he had won this race or even finished second, he would have gone into Indy with a hammerlock on the series. This opens things right up. Pretty slow rollout, which helps support that gear argument, Bobby. Well, not, let's just watch and see if he gets back up to speed. If he did, then obviously he did run out of fuel. If not, remember, these are sequential gear transmission. Or in other words, to the people who ride motorcycles, they're just like a motorcycle. And all the cars today are that way of the new models. Now, that means that you put it in first, go to second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. All right, Jack now's had a chance to talk with the Penske team. I talked with Chuck Sprague, and here's exactly what it gave us. They were surmising the same way we did. At first, they were referring to it as a temporary gear shifting problem. The car was hung up in gear. Chuck Sprague, though, much like you did, Bobby Unser, thought maybe it wasn't that, and maybe they had run out of fuel. They've ascertained that they had not run out of fuel, but they are very, very concerned about the gearbox. Jack, it looks like they're in trouble again. We see the car moving very slowly around the back part of the track. Whatever struck has struck again. Well, it seems to get hung up in a gear, and during practice, that last practice session this morning, that was a problem that befell Al Lunser Jr. Jack, they so had this problem. Concerned about it. They had this problem with uh, two of the three cars back on Friday. They felt they had it beat. And, uh, but he's going to stay out. I don't understand that. Well, he's Maybe he's probably, hoping it's going to get back up into a gear and he can go? Well, he's still trying to figure out, can he overcome the problem by shifting a little bit different and something like that. All they do with a gear shift is go forward and back with it from one to the other. Again, sequential on the shift. So in order to get the second, he has to go from six to second and so on. And naturally, when you're shifting up, you go from one to the other like that. But going down, you have to shift a bunch of times. Emerson Fittipaldi being very careful. As you see, the new leader of the race, Al Unser Jr., comes around completing his 66 lap now with Nigel Mansell running in second and in third it's Robbie Gordon back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach Nigel Mansell with a problem the right rear tire shredding off of the wheel he's going to limp back to the pits obviously it was a cut tire not a blown tire but a cut tire Got to run it flat. You can look at it. It looks like it's still on the car, but the wheel is a whole lot wider what that tire is. He had the misfortune to have it happen early in the lap, so he's had to make his way around the entire track at low speed. Looking down on Long Beach, yesterday here, they held the annual Toyota Pro Celebrity Race. Sam Posey takes a closer look at the fun-filled event. Yeah. Pro football players, actors, and a sports doing, writer were among the 13 exciting celebrities wheeling identical Toyotas through the streets. Also in the race, but starting behind the celebrities, would be four seasoned pros, including the man who back in 1976 won the first Grand Prix here, Clay Regazzoni. Paralyzed in a subsequent accident at this track, Regazzoni has developed special controls for his car. The ring inside the steering wheel is his throttle. Shifting is with a manually operated clutch. The brake is that lever in the foreground. Despite the tragedy that befell him here, Clay is happy to be back. Oh, I still have a good, uh, a good remember from Long Beach for my, for the, my victory in 1976 with the uh, Ferrari. And uh, it's nice to be back and uh, see a nice town, old friends, new friends, new drivers, and driver again, race again. At the start, Alfonso Rivero, star of Fresh Prince of Bel Air, takes the lead. A cool dude on the screen. He's hot in the streets. Then behind him, trouble. Jet skier Christy Carlson blasts inside actor Paul Gosseler while Brian Redman in the maroon car takes the lead of the pros as they charge through the field. Regazzoni out with mechanical trouble. Rivero wins and talks of actually becoming a driver, while Brian Redman, who won the first ever race here 19 years ago, beats the other pro. The pro celebrity race, a lot of fun here. Jack and I haven't driven it in a while. I, mean, I think uh, we wrecked too many cars well, when I, we were there. I think they decided that the Toyotas were too expensive with you guys on board. But it was your advice and guidance that got us there. Al Unser Jr. leads it. We'll look through the running order. Robbie Gordon now comes up and picks up second place. And by staying alive and, and fighting hard, Raul Boisel is now in third. But Nigel Mansell has dropped back to fifth because of that tire, Gary Gerald. Paul, he got into the pits. It was 13 and a half seconds to make the change and to get the full complement of fuel that should take him the rest of the distance. They believed that the reason for the flat was contact from behind by Michael Andretti. 
Now he drops back, but on the radio, they're already telling Nigel, they're in good shape, we're all right. I think what they want to do is make sure they finish and get those championship points. Yeah, just keep in mind that on these tires, that they're tubeless. They're tubeless tires, they're very, very thin. So if you look at the front wing in a car, the side plates, for example, could be a knife. If a wing goes up, just touches somebody's tire, it just slices it. Another quick spin on, and again, the All three Tracy. car of Paul Tracy. Trouble. And of course, you know, there's been bad blood already between Nigel Mansell and Michael Andretti. They had words just before the start at uh, Australia. So this is just another chapter in what may become a hot story as the year develops. There is second place, 72nd lap for Robbie Gordon. He is 28 seconds behind the leader of the race. A good deal of ground to make up. One would suggest almost an impossible amount of ground. But also keep in mind that all during practice, as we've watched all of it this weekend, Robbie Gordon has been one of the fastest cars, sometimes the fastest car during practice. The kid is one heck of a hard charger. He'll never give up. He'll either wear the car out, wreck it, or try to beat little Al hard. Get a further update, Gary Gerald. Just a few minutes ago, we had talked to Derek Walker about how the Robbie Gordon day was progressing. Walker, of course, the owner of the team that puts Robbie on the track. He said, well, I don't think we've got enough to match the Penske's. That was just moments before Emerson encountered his problem. He said, it's the usual slipping and sliding on the streets. We wish we may have had a little more downforce, but we think we're okay. So all in all, a, a pretty positive outlook. We almost got an identical report reg regarding uh, Raul Boisel, who was running in the next position back and on the lead lap. Well, we're riding here with Robbie Gordon. Of course, he had accidents in his test sessions. Oh, another spin. Well, I'll tell you what, getting into that corner has been tough for everybody. It's one of oh. the Pac West cars, and he's right in the middle of the line. Yeah, the, well, look at this. The, the, from the Dominic, I'm sure that's Dominic Dobson right there, although I can't. The cars are identical in color, so it's Dobson sitting out there. But you know, the bad thing about him it is, it's a terrible position to be sitting in for both the guys on the track and himself. Well, they've got to get it out of there, and there is the question whether or not this should be a full course yellow. Yes, and you can see the course workers are not opting to go out there and help get him off the deal. Look what the cars have to do to go around it. Well, that's not that far down. Why don't you go out there and give him a point? I wasn't even going to offer that part, Paul. I'll if tell you what. Of course, Marshall's here. Of course, all volunteers. They work day on day on day. Here's on board with Nigel Mansell. Cross the start-finish line. Now look ahead for the yellow flags and then for that car in the course. And remember, he's going 190 right about here as he hits the brakes hard. Now he sees it. It's a pretty good view of it. Remember that Robbie Gordon right now is 26 seconds back of Al Unser Jr. So if there is a full course yellow, it will have a material effect on the incident. Here we are now riding with Gordon as he sees the same thing. Whoa. Yeah, that's really close. Remember, the guys that can make it on the inside, that's where the track is clean. The guys that have to go on the outside, that's where you find the marble. That isn't an easy place to go around. And, of course, they're going to have to move that car out of the way. So the next lap, you think, is you're a driver. You put yourself in Robbie Gordon's seat. You know you got to remember what's going on and look for it next time. Here we go. Let's look at the spin. spin. There it is. Same problem that Tracy seems to have. Too much rear brake, not enough front brake, and you spin. There's no choice either. A guy's got to keep stopping when he gets down there. Going from 190 miles an hour to stay down to 70. Hey, you got to stop. That's all there is to it. Let's look at Michael as he was following Nigel. They, by the way, in a battle for position here. Uh, Whoa! Little close, huh? Just a little close. But then that Nigel the definitely tire? slowed suddenly, didn't he? Because of yeah. traffic. He was in a bind, too. I don't think you can fall. No, he had traffic to the inside. Yeah. That's yeah. racing right there. Yeah. Race summary after 76 laps. Five late changes, nine cars out of the race. And we've had one full course caution for six laps. So still waiting with no full course yellow. They're going to clear that car of Dominic Dobson without going full course. And Al Hunter Jr. leads after 77 laps. Back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, you ride with the fifth place car, Nigel Mansell, anticipating pit stops, what should be the final stop of the race any time now here. Tonight, IBC begins with America's Funniest Hour, then followed by Lewis Clark and Jane Seymour, stars 
in the ABC movie world premiere of Passion for Justice. That's all here on ABC tonight. A couple of cars that, uh, while the battles have been going on, have been doing a fantastic job. From 19th to 9th, Adrian Fernandez. From 26th to 10th, Robbie Buell. Let's go to Jack Aru. Al Unser Jr. in for what should be his final stop of the afternoon. Working very methodically, but the concern for everyone on pit road is this 60 mile an hour speed limit. They are completing their work, and this time Al Jr. is far more careful coming down pit road. We'll wait and see if he's under the 66 drop dead speed limit. He's going to stay under it this time, Jack. I can about guarantee you he's got a pretty good lead in the race. Penske's already told him, man, no matter what, don't get another stop and go, because that really could cost him the race. Very careful on the exit. Carefully with just two lines over. Looked perfectly legal to me. Al Unser Jr., very heads-up driver and very good here. Robbie oh. Gordon should be due for a stop any time. Four victories, of course, in his career for Al Unser Jr. here. This victory, if it comes, his fifth would give him 20 IndyCar wins in his career, put him run one behind Emerson Fittipaldi. Now we're going to see Al, little Al, he's on his last fuel stop. He won't have to stop again without problems. We're going to see him taking better care of the transmission and trying to guarantee that he doesn't overuse fuel or anything like that for the remainder. It was good here to see the family of Don Sully Sullivan. We look at one of the Ford powered cars. He was one of the chief engineers for the first flathead V8 production engine for Ford, 1932. He passed away recently, but family here watching the race today. That was the most famous racing engine in the world for many, 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 many years. You know, I thought that would never be. I'll tell you who we are missing, though. Uh, regulars that have been competing in IndyCar racing the last few years, Danny Sullivan, Roberto Guerrero, Scott Brayton, Eddie Cheever, do not have rides this year. They are much missed. Do you anticipate they show at Indy? Well, I think some of them will in one form or another. I think they'd all like to, Sam. They're just looking for a good ride. That's what it all amounts to. This, of course, the final race before the great Indianapolis 500. ABC will be there on top of everything throughout the month of May. And think of what a win here would mean to, to Al Unser Jr., a winner at Indianapolis a couple of years back in Eclipse really since then as the Dallas team unraveled a bit over the last couple of years. Now he's fallen into the best team in the business. Many people said, could they run three cars competently? The answer is yes. Robbie Gordon, who picked up the lead of the race on Al Unser Jr.'s pit stop, has now completed the 82nd lap, 41 laps since his last stop. Now that seems to be pretty much within the window, but last week at Phoenix, they had this car in the lead of the race and ran it out of fuel. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. Yeah. Well, re just remember, this is Derek Walker that owns and runs that team. He makes a decision about Robbie Gordon. Derek used to work for Finsky for many years, without doubt. He's one of the best team managers in the business, so he'll gamble and shuffle everything he can to get any advantage. Or He'll definitely take a gamble on fuel. Robbie Buell, who runs ninth, has gone 42 laps since his last stop. That's the furthest lead reach out since the last stop. We keep riding Robbie Gordon. He's going to stay up. There he comes. He comes into the pits. Robbie Gordon, leader of the race at the moment. Al Hunter Jr. should pick up the lead as he flashes by on the main straightaway. Gary Gerald is there. They were very concerned about that fuel problem that ran him out of the race last week at Phoenix, but they said they found the problem. They wouldn't talk about it. They were not concerned coming in today. He's here for his final service. He's got a shot today in his first ever IndyCar victory. He was second last year at Mid-Ohio. We've got him rolling in 13.3 seconds, Paul. Raul Boisel in third place as Robbie Gordon rolls back to the track, and I use the word rolls advisedly. Very, very careful. They can't accelerate until they get past those last pits. Boisel now should be the next car to come in as he comes in and picks up second place with Robbie Gordon's pit stop. Well, that beautiful onboard camera that's on Robbie Gordon's car, you can see how he accelerated a little bit too fast, and he slowed right back down. You can see that from the camera. It's the best onboard camera shots I've ever seen. Boisel is having himself a fine Day. He, of course, was in many ways the unsung hero of last year. He came very, very close to winning several races, including the Indianapolis 500 for the Dick Simon team. Dick Simon has been around as a car owner for many, many years. He, too, has 
gone winless through all these many seasons of effort. It would be great to see Bosell, who pits now, have some success. Raul well, Boisell turns on to pit road. Jack Root waits. And Paul Dick Simons, Duracell crew, is going to do a calculated stop. Not a time stop, but 15 gallons. They have measured exactly how many gallons. They've got a mark on the tank. When they hit it, they pull and disconnect. And now they're going to drop. They're having a problem changing the rear tires. They've completed that. In 10.9 seconds, he's off and away. He's looking for second spot. Doesn't think he can beat Unser Jr., but he thinks he can go into second. We're looking, too, for Robbie Gordon, who now is down in the first turn. Side by side turn with Taylor Fabi. And battling with Teo Fabi, though not a battle for position. But nevertheless, he certainly did get out ahead of Raul Boisel. It's really not like Robbie Gordon let anybody pass him because he normally wouldn't know that we're for a position or not right then because Teo is really on the move right now. But you know, Bobby, this is a great drive for Robbie Gordon. I started to say earlier that he had crashes in all his testing uh, situations, including a really bad one in Phoenix. But uh, and trouble, of course, at the first race of Surfer's Paradise. This is a very steady run he is having, and he's being rewarded by attrition ahead of him on the road. I think he could realize today that a steady run could bring great fruits. The yellow car tail, Fabi, is 10th place, a lap behind the lead of the race. The blue and white car, Robbie Gordon, just another mention. In my opinion, he's a young A.J. Foyt, just Michael, a stubborn. Michael Andretti makes his stop, Gary. As usual, he brings it in hot. He doesn't have to lock up the tires, but he hits those marks perfectly, and this crew goes to work. Elated, of course, as he came back to IndyCar racing with a victory on the streets of Australia, but as we alluded earlier, it's been a disappointing weekend in many respects. He's rolling smoothly just under 14 seconds. He should be good for the rest of the distance. Michael Andretti comes in in fourth place. Adrian Fernandez passed him on the straightaway as he made the stop. He should come out and join the field somewhere very close to his father, Mario. He'll be making his last passes down the shoreline drive here. Again, look at all the breaking marks as they go into the first turn. And Michael is coming back up to speed. Al Unser Jr has a 36 second lead over second place Nigel Mansell. Robbie Gordon is third. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, one of the world's most enduring symbols, the Goodyear Blimp Eagle based in Carson, California, has been providing these beautiful aerial pictures. Goodyear Blimps have been flying over major sporting events since 1925. Emerson Fittipaldi with a gearbox problem. Now he's pit side with Jack Aroot. And Paul, he made a hasty ba trip back here because the first person you went to talk to was Roger Penske and Alan Sir Jr.'s pit. What did you try to do? Describe what had happened to your gearbox so they could radio to Al Jr.? Yes, exactly, Jack. I mean, my car was flying. I was so happy the way the race was going. And then I started having problems with shifts from fifth to fourth. And then I lost fourth, third, second, and then uh, all the gears. And I just told Roger, for oh, so all really be careful because it's we, we have a critical problem in the gearbox. I hope we can finish. I mean, he runs so strong. Well, let's check in with Gary Gerald for some more information on pit road. Jack, there was momentary concern that Michael Andretti may have had a broken header, but the crew says it sounds fine as it came by the front straightaway just seconds ago. Interesting note on Raul Boisel. We understand the team was fined hundred dollars for unintended equipment on pit road. Dick Simon's comment, it was worth it for an 11 second pit stop. Also, Adrian Fernandez started 17th. He was fifth when he made his pit stop. He's running solidly in the top 10. A much more impressive showing for this young man. Boy, no question about that. Nigel Mansell now second place, but 37 seconds behind Al Unser Jr. Bobby Unser, that, that tire actually worked out in a, in, in a strange sort of way. Well, it really did. If he's got enough fuel to go to the last, which I think he does, and he, he, the tire didn't hurt him that much because one of the things is he was able to avoid the last hairpin. The new rules allow you to come in what they call the shortcut into the pit, which saved him probably another 8 to 15 seconds, Paul. That's a big saving all the way around for a guy with flat tires. The point is that both the leader and the second place driver have had their problems during this race, just as Paul Tracy, who won it last year, had to make two pit stops for cut tires. So this is an incident-filled race. Key battle on the course as Teo Fabi has been battling the last several laps, trying to hold off a charging Stefan Johansson battle for position. And at the same time, the leaders have been working their way through this. So here is an ongoing battle for ninth place that the leaders have to handle up. 
Babby has really run hard today. I think it's as hard as I've seen Tail run for a long time. His position doesn't show as hard as he's really been running. As they come on to the pit straight now, off of that final hairpin, just ahead, you see there is Fernandez in the red and green car. He is also involved in this fight. He currently runs in eighth place. So Bobby's trying to catch Fernandez. While at the same time, Johansson is trying to catch Bobby. And right behind Bobby, of course, is Robbie Gordon, who needs to get by them pretty quick in order to chase Little Al. So it's getting to be a pretty tight race towards the end here. This will be a test of Gordon's patience and his skill. 93 laps into the record book. There's a green and red car of Adrian Fernandez. In a lot of ways, he's been the star of the show today. He's really come from a long way back to being way up in the top 10 consistently. The 88 car there is Mauricio Guzelman. He also is holding on for position, running in seventh place right now. And Fernandez is there and ready to fight. All four of them now begin to move close together, so we're going to end up with a four-way battle for seventh place here. Of course, everybody works the entire race, Paul, to get down to the very last and have their shootouts dead. The middle of the race is usually just for position. Fernandez and Guzman both running the Renault chassis, which is new this year. Both teams very pleased with it, at least so far. So these are nearly identical machines. Two key passing areas here at Long Beach. One off of Seaside, they're heading for that right now where you can slam down the gears and try to get inside your competitor, block the corner on him and take the corner away. Neither one can do that there. The other key at the end of the long main straightaway. Yes, and the track is slippery right now, and the tires are pretty well worn right now, so it's hard to drive in the turn deeper than the other guys. So in front, it's Al Unser Jr., 35 seconds ahead of Nigel Mansell as we move to the final 10 laps here in Long Beach. Back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, where our EDS scoring system is showing Al Unser Jr. 35.68 seconds ahead of second place Nigel Mansell. Ten seconds behind Mansell is Robbie Gordon. Raul Boisel runs in fourth place. Those four are the only one on the leader lap. How many times we've watched Al Jr. reel off the last laps in command of this race. This time, however, it has dramatic consequences in terms of the championship. A win here would bring him 32, 37 points, which would tie exactly his teammate Emerson Fittipaldi for the lead in the PPG Championship. Here's that fight that continues between Teo Fabi and Adrian Fernandez. Adrian Fernandez currently runs in eighth place. Fabi is right there. We watch the battle from the nose of Robbie Gordon's car, who runs in third and seems to be a little wary of getting involved in this fight. Well, he doesn't seem to be pressing hard right now. It isn't like a Robbie Gordon way. Normally, he would just annihilate those guys. So maybe he is getting smarter, like Sam said a little while ago. Well, Bobby, I think the point is a resolve when you see the gaps between the drivers. I think Gordon realizes that even if he gets by, he's probably too far behind Mansell to reel him in. But similarly, Gordon is far enough ahead of Bosell that he can afford to be cautious at least for a few laps, maybe not the whole way. And Sam, he needs to do it. He's driving for a super good team in Derek Walker this year, so he needs to show that he's smart as well as fast. Yeah, that's the point. That, that's what he could add to his resume today, is to be smart. So, so far, we, we know he's quick. Teo Fabi continues to work at the back of Fernandez. Looks like he's in a position. If he's going to make a try, it may occur as they come off of Seaside. Look how hard he's trying there as he locks him up. That was my word. You can't say he's not trying, Paul. Fabi would move into eighth place if he could get by Fernandez. That's the Jim Hall team, the yellow car right there. Bobby, that's the Jim Hall team. They've not done so well in racing the last couple of years. They're really trying hard to get all their momentum gathered back up again. So for the moment at least, Teo Fabi cannot get the job done. Al Unser Jr. has the lead of the race with 99 laps complete. We'll be back with the finish. Little Al has won at least one race every season since 88. Jr. has had his lead whittled down just a little bit. Now only 29 seconds ahead of Nigel Mansell. Mansell's doing everything he can. Little Al is being careful. In fact, a very careful pass just a moment ago of Dominic Dobson. He now runs alone 
and has clear sailing ahead as we come to the closing laps here in Long Beach. If he wins, this, of course, will be a win in his third start for Penske. It took Emerson Fittipaldi 15 starts to win a race for Roger, and Paul Tracy 16 starts. Mommy, you drove for Roger for many years. What will that do for little Al in terms of his relationship with Roger? Well, his relationship couldn't be any better than it is right now, no matter if he, even if he won Indianapolis. He thinks the sun rises and moon sets a little out. The thing that will make a difference is, is Roger fuels himself on winning. If he wins, he just becomes obsessed with winning more. There's nobody like Roger Penske in the racing world. And history will always show that he is an individual that nobody else has ever come close to. And remember, it is Roger Penske who is individually masterminding the pit strategy of Al Unser Jr. today. Jerry Breon and I were talking this morning on that team, and, and both of us agreed that without Roger's motivation, without his drive, without his strong desires, everybody in the team would probably be only 50% of what they are. He makes them all better. By the way, that battle between Fabi and Fernandez has broken off with Fernandez remaining in eighth place as they come toward the flags with uh, just one more lap to go after he flashes down the front straight here. It's Unser Jr., Mansell, Gordon, Boisel, Mario, and then Michael Andretti, then Mauricio Guzman as we start the final lap. Well, how about that stat you revealed at the beginning of the show that for the last three years, the man who started second went on to win. This could be the fourth consecutive year for that. And everybody will battle for second next year. How do you figure that one out? If you're trying to qualify for the polls, ah, I want to only be a thousand slower than the poll. Just think the life or the feelings that little Al is leading right now, knowing how bad he really wants to win for the Roger Pinsky team, worrying about the transmission and traffic. A cut tire could even lose the race for him right now. He's in clear traffic, though, Bobby, with only a couple of turns to go. He could probably, if he can accelerate off the hairpin here, coast home. Slide that far as them. Al Unser Jr. about to reassert himself as the king of the beach as he takes the Penske car across the line and picks up the twin checkered flags. Al Unser Jr. is the winner in the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Chasing toward the flag now, Nigel Mansell, as the celebration begins with the Penske team. I know a special moment for mechanic Richard Buck, who spent a lot of time with little Al in the sprint car days. So a victory once again for that team. Here comes Nigel Mansell, the final three corners of the course. Little Al already saluting the crowd and beginning to slow. Is that a happy kid or what? Oh, uh, he's happy today. Nigel Mansell threw the hairpin for the very last time. His teammate Mario Andretti will be coming to the line too for the last time here. And here is Nigel Mansell, comes toward the flag and picks up second place. Robbie Gordon will come across in third, Raul Boisel fourth, and Mario Andretti finishes in fifth. We'll be back to talk to the winner. Unofficial results in the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach as we look at the top six. Al Unser Jr. has taken his 20th career win and his fifth at Long Beach. He's with Jackaroo. Well, he just got the congratulations of his wife, Shelly. He's getting the congratulations of the rest of his crew. Al Jr., you're back being the king of the beach, but let's talk a little bit about the concerns about the gearbox. Emerson Fittipaldi went out and they radioed into you about it. How concerned were you out there? Uh, my gearbox was great. Fourth and fifth was really good, and uh, you know I was I was re really excited on that first stop, and uh, and I forgot I had a sequential shift, and so I started grinding the gears back and forth, and but uh, you know the the Marlboro Team Penske is a super operation, and and I am just really really proud of them, and and uh, proud of our Buck. I mean super job, and uh, and I just like to say hello to my my kids at home, Cody, Shannon, Little Al. Wish we were here. Well, congratulations to Al Unser Jr. and the rest of Team Penske. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. Gary? Jack, indeed. Nigel Mansell toweling down the helmet off. You make such a bold move now, just two points out of the championship lead on a day when you have a tire go down and you had a very close call with two cars in front of you. Uh, this is turning out real well. Hey, did you see that on television on uh, the back straight there yes. with the two? Holy smoke. I mean, I was almost spinning and just caught it. That was a bit dicey. And, uh, and then... Uh, 180, 190 miles an hour on three wheels. I didn't enjoy that either. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the crew worked fantastic, and the Newman Haas team, uh, God bless them, they got me to the finish. Terrific job, Nigel. He's right there in the championship point hunt just that quick, Paul. 
very much in the fight and of course looking for a chance to take a win at the Indianapolis 500. But little Al should remember this. No Long Beach winner has ever won Indy after winning Long Beach in the same year. Coming up next month on ABC, it's back to the Brickyard. First on Saturday, May 14th, Auto Racing's best try to beat the clock and grab the pole as we begin coverage of the Indianapolis 500 time trials. Then two weeks later, May 29th, it's the sport's most spectacular event, the Indianapolis 500 Live. All next month here on ABC Sports. When we come back, we'll take another look at Robbie Gordon, who finishes third, and we'll see the standings. Finishing third in this 20th anniversary of racing in Long Beach, Robbie Gordon. He's with Jack. Well, Robbie, Bobby Unser said throughout the course of the race that maybe today you proved to people that not only are you quick, but you're smart. Was this a thinking man's race? Well, I, th I think we played the same game we played last weekend down at Phoenix. We had a car we could win with down there. We ran ourselves out of gas trying to play the game. But, you know, here we just rode along all day and, um, and turned it up when we needed to. But I guess we, uh, we didn't turn it, enough, turn it up enough in traffic. We just paid it too cautious. How tough was the traffic out there for someone like you? Uh, traffic was terrible. I say I saw about three accidents in front of me. You know, I, I just didn't want to be involved in one of them, so I laid back a little bit and rode along. Indy coming up next. Indy coming up next. At least we got a few points. Looking forward to it. Paul. All right, well, let's take a look at the finishing order here. Still unofficial. It takes about 30 minutes to post it. At the conclusion of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, of course, Little Al takes his 20th win, followed by Nigel, Robbie Gordon, Raul Boisel, then the Andretti family. They're having a pretty good run, and they're staying together on these courses. Mauricio Guzelman, that's a terrific run for him. Fernandez, Teo Fabi, that's the way that battle ends up. Teo was not able to get around. Then Ari Leindijk, Stefan Johansson, Frank Freon from the Indy Lights with a terrific run here at Long Beach. Robbie Groff, Davy Jones, Jack Vilnev, Robbie Buell. He was up as high as 10th at one point, and just he's, his face lights up every time he sees that he can get in an Indy car. Dominic Dobson, Willie T. Ribs in 18th position. Scott Goodyear, Paul Tracy, Emerson Fittipaldi, Alessandro Zampedri, Marco Greco, and Jimmy Vassar. So we, we look to the final section of the final results. Good run for Claude Bourbonnet, Mike Groff, Scott Sharp, Buddy Lazier, Bobby Rahal. Groff and Rahal, of course, some work to be done there on the Honda engine before they head off to Indianapolis. Bobby Enzer, what do we look forward to now? Three races under our belt, and Indy is next. Well, the big news, obviously, is going to be Mercedes-Benz and Roger Penske team. That's where it's going to be. Look how tight the points battle is right now. Little Al and Emmo tied at 37. Nigel close behind. Well, I agree with uh, Bobby as we I agree with Bobby as we look ahead to Indy. I mean, Penske's won two in a row, but at Indy, the team takes the biggest gamble they may have taken in their whole career by going to Mercedes-Benz. A month from now, we'll be seeing how it works out in qualifying, and two weeks later on May 29th in the race itself. I'll tell you what, there is so much to look forward to at this year's Indy 500. I can't wait to get to the track on opening day and for the coverage throughout the entire month. All of the great stories, changes in teams, the addition of Al Unser Jr. to the Penske team, the Mercedes, the Honda, the Ford. I mean, everything is looking so good for that month. Well, suppose the Mercedes has the power that everybody is speculating that it might, a thousand horsepower or more. We are going to see new lap records at Indianapolis. How about straightaway speed, Sam? What if I tell you a possibility 250 miles an hour on the straightaway? Think about it. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. And I'm not drunk. So, <laughs> so Al Hunter Jr. Yeah. takes his fifth win in the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. And now we look ahead to the Indianapolis 500. Little Al in second and third. Nigel Mansell and Robbie Gordon now taking a ride around this track and being applauded by the tremendous crowd here. The Indy 500 is next. This is Paul Page for Sam Posey, Bobby Unzer, Jack Aroot, and Gary Gerald. So long. Thanks for joining us in Long Beach.